Today, we're really fortunate to have David Ray with us. Uh, David Ray is the author of several books of poetry, including Wool Highways and other poems, and The Tramp's Cup, both of which received the Poetry Society of America's William Carlos Williams Award. Not far from the river from Copper Canyon Press, um, the Maharani's New Wall, Wesleyan University Press, uh, are some of the other books. Uh, the last, that book was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Sam's book was also published by Wesleyan University Press, and that won the Maurice English Poetry Award. Um, David Ray has also received a National Endowment for the Arts Award for his fiction, and he's a professor of English at the University of Missouri, uh, Kansas City. Uh, he's won um, so many awards, it would be impossible to name them all. Um, he's certainly been an active force in poetry uh, in the United States, and I think that his poetry has in it that kind of universal quality, that ability to speak intelligently but also feelingly about being human and about the human heart. And let's welcome David Ray. Um, thanks for uh, returning what I left in there. When I write, I go into a bit of a trance and I walk off and leave things. Um, I wrote a couple of poems one time in the Austin Public Library. Don't let me leave that. And uh, walked off from them. And uh, I, when I went back looking, the librarian said, um, well, there was a fellow with a beard here doing some research on air conditioning, and he had a yellow pad. So I went around the streets of Austin looking for a guy with a beard and a yellow pad, uh, asking if he had my poems. Well, then I had to rewrite them, and you know, that's like trying to uh, dream the same dream a second time, so it doesn't work out. Maria was kind enough to ask me to read The Red Shoes. It all comes back to me, The Red Shoes, that film and the evening we saw it and you a dancer. You had danced on that very stage, the high school renting the theater and me feeling myself blush as you lifted your legs like the Degas dancer, your little fluff skirt light as moth wings. Everyone a dancer or composer, Lermontov says you can dance, so you can go to Paris on tour. Did he add, my dear? Did he add, my dear? And after that film, the rush of wings, the disappointment, did someone die, fall off the rocks at Monte Carlo? Damned if I can remember. All I know for sure is that the arts were so easy, so wonderful, just being lifted like balloons into the wind, fame and fortune, the gambling tables, immortality like stars, we drove up the mountain and you were aflame with desire to keep dancing and your blouse was quickly undone. Breast in my hand and our kiss. Then down to earth, not so firm. Inquisitions for both of us. Witches and wizards, beatings sustained for our love. Not all who danced were so beautiful as you who entered the film when I lost you. The vast room of fantasy, nothing else ever. And the chorus of cactus watched, still there perhaps for the lovers, for those who have left the film, the vast room of fantasy, return to the crust of the desert or the back seat of the car, real enough to make love in. And sometimes that's what love needs, hard reality, though what whirls on in the head is real enough too. Constellation of freckles, red hair whipped round in the wind, year after year touching my face, and blossoms of stone, petal of heartwood, eyes of agate. There's another one here uh, about a movie that I'd like to read um, called Gorillas in the Midst uh, for Jane Goodall. We watch Gorillas in the Mist. Evidently, it is nicer to be gorillas than to be people like us. The lady was at war with the bad people. She loved the good gorillas who beat their chests, fought for their children, died trying. But she was no match, of course, for the bad people, which seems to be the case in all the bad places that were once paradise. One sees how hard it is to save anything, a tree, a tusk, 
an infant gorilla. I'm surprised if I can save from the fire of time one poem, one shard of the jug we drank from. The lady flies into a rage, for they've attacked again those with the law on their side. The grieving babe is carried off in a crate, another theft off her sacred mountain. The bad men want heads for trophies, babies for zoos, hands for ashtrays. The hand she held, feeling that touch, that flow of one being into another, what Michelangelo painted on the ceiling. Seeing we must still look up to, something of the divine. She found it there in the jungle, but then the movie is over, and a wise one among us tells us the lady was not such a nice person. The lover in the movie was not her lover. The man that part was based on said he didn't even like her, and her hair was always unkempt. She was irrational, you might say, warring with the locals who had to make a living off gorillas. She had smoked herself so close to death that her murder was merciful, a blessing, and so on. It seems that only in movies heroes and heroines are perfect. Swift loved the horses, and she the gorillas, we say, and leave it at that. Uh, you know, that's a reference to the Wynnums uh, Jonathan Swift uh, had in Gulliver's Travels was so sure that um, they were better than people. Um, and so you see, those of you who are in the workshop, that the inner critic uh, works on people on the outside, too. If, you, if you're critical toward yourself, you're going to be very critical toward others. Um, I'd like to read a few poems from Kangaroo Paws, which is the latest book. Uh, it's about Australia. Um, my wife and I lived out there for a year in Western Australia, although we, we moved around somewhat. Um, and so these poems uh, use some uh, Aussie language, some Australian. This is a poem called For Dennis. Um, and it's got an epigraph from the Australian poet Dennis Haskell, words unspoken, ashes in a jar. Amazing, a man who grieved for his father as I grieved for a son. He would gladly have leapt into the grave, changed places. And I, who always had a hollow all through my chest instead of a father, stand amazed, impressed as if at a grave's edge. I, who heard my father, like many another, had died. But only one son ever dies. Immeasurable grief swims the seas, all whales. Never a minnow swims out in that salt, where there's pain beyond belief and no relief. And here's a cheerful one called the Hemlock Society. I don't know how many of you subscribe. <clears throat> She helped herself along with a few pills tucked away for just such an occasion. A very brave woman, out of it now, not wanting to become a mere vegetable, a burden to others. What are the years that they lead us only to this, the hemlock? And no one believes it when you say you are ready. Have no regrets. They themselves plan to hold on more tenaciously even while wilting to flummery, even while adding 10 tons of stone on the daughter and 10 on each son. My dearest, make sure our subscription's paid up and keep the stash handy. I love that word flummery. You know, poems are built around individual words. That word glazed makes the red wheelbarrow, doesn't it? And flummery, well, look it up yourself. It's a wonderful word. This is Jack. And um, a lot of my stuff just comes from a remark that somebody makes or uh, something of that sort. And this was one remark that I felt I had to make a case for. It's like a museum where there's something in a case and the poem is the, the case. <coughs> So this is called Jack. In Australia, a scholar tells me, we're undergoing a renaissance of Kerouac. It seems they love the guy. 
And I think of Jack, slumped in his worn out chair down in Florida, drinking and smoking himself to death, with sullen eyes watching his mother move around the room, yelling Stella at her like Marlon Brando in Streetcar. Stella would bring him his drinks and his smokes, and now and then in the rocking Florida twilight, Jack would lean forward and hug her around the hips, pressing his face against her fallen womb. Go on, Jack, she would say, her hand on his hair. Let it all out. And Jack would weep enough for both of them. Then Stella would push him away and make her rounds of the room, tipping out ashes, picking up bottles. Well, uh, let's read one more here from Kangaroo Paws. Gulliver's Travels has an epigraph from Catherine Susanna Pritchard, who's a very great novelist in Australia. It was a terrible thing men had done to the great tree. She dreaded the vengeance of the tree. <coughs> Above Perth in King's Park, near the lit up obelisk with names of the war dead, a great Kari tree lies on blocks a tribute to the logging industry of Australia. The single log is nearly 300 feet long and six feet thick, and it's a wonder how it was hauled out of the forest. By no means the largest, the bronze plaque assures. And what's it used for, I asked, this hardest and best of all woods, nearly extinct now? Toilet paper, answers my guide, most of it goes to Japan as chips for toilet paper. Next day, I grieve not the war dead, flowers still left for them over three score and 10 years after their war, but the logs I mourn, the gullivers men climb and crawl upon and haul out of the forest that we and the Japanese may wipe our asses smooth. <laughs> Well, Fremantle, um, near Perth, where, where we lived, is a very moody old town. Um, they used to haul a lot of whales in. And uh, so this is called Frio. And it's just imagining the uh, drunks who wandered along the streets there, because there were a lot of them. With hangover hurting, he will wake miles from Frio, thinking how cold that wind from the sea felt, although it was gentle, that sea breeze, and all in his mind. The rest of it, the convicts transported for life. They still rattled their chains, and the ghosts of whales were weeping, and yet he was only walking in moonlight down the street in old Frio. There are places that have become so touristed um, that they've completely lost any sense of what they w once were. But if you listen very closely, it's almost like you can hear the ghosts. Uh, there are a lot of places like that. Um, Hobart is one of those where they were in, uh, where they had the um, penal colony. Um, and one of the most notorious prisons in Australia. Well, uh, I'll, I'll read you one because you're writers. Uh, nobody but a writer would uh, understand this. It's called Lost. On my last day in Sydney, I grieved my lost blue notebook everywhere, made fruitless, foolish queries wherever we had been. I kept getting floors of buildings mixed up since they have a different system, walk in on two and call it ground. I've got to sit down and get centered more, I told myself, before a car clips me. They drive on the left and I step out too soon after a glance to the left, then looking right. My German friend was killed that way in London. Others put cigarettes out on their arms. 
I just write my thoughts in blue notebooks, then make sure I lose them. Ineffable grief I have suffered time and again, sharing all I am, my most intimate thoughts, seeking them down alleys, since cops always say, they throw away papers, mate, they don't want them. So some stranger winds up with those fragments and shards I need in order to glue myself back together, just to be real like some kid in a fable who doesn't want to be lost. Afflicted, abandoned, tossed out on junk heaps, scattered in alleys, or made the butt of a joke. Hey, listen to this one. In one notebook, I grieve another. In one city, remember a dark day in another. And uh, to a child of Baghdad. Our bombs may blast you to a better life. You and your vivid parrot may even change places. We give you a chance, at least, to better yourself. Who knows? You may be born beneath a lucky star next time. Maybe live in our land of milk and honey and do some bombing yourself. They say you'll die this year, that our bombs did it, the power outage, polluted water, that sort of thing. But they're stretching a point. If you knew these bombs, you would love them. We draw faces on them. We keep them spit-shined and give them pet names. And they are smart. That's how they found you. I should have put that term smart bombs in here as an epigraph because I think a lot of people don't know already. You know, these terms go out of fashion very quickly. In, in this case, thank God. I'll read one more poem from this. Uh, it's called Bad Bog. And this is about a television program. I always tell my students never write about something that's on television because it's been digested and edited and it's third hand and everything. And then I sit down and write, write about something that's on television. The programs on bad bogs, how to get out of if you're stuck in the outback, how to get back on track, get your wheels unstuck and the rest of you too. It seems there are ways of pulling yourself out of quicksand, using nothing but a rope and your own ingenuity. Who has a rope? There are times when your engine has failed, when all you can do is fix up some shade and lie in it, careful not to use up any energy. Who has energy? There are times when shade of your hats, just to start, use mud on the rest of you. There are times when a stick can dig you out, man, out of the worst mess you ever got in. Who's got a stick? There are times, mate, when a lizard's the best friend you've had ever. Who's had a friend? There are times when you boil the swamp in your billy, find it's just fine. Look for nuggets, rattle your cup, note that lizard's blue tongue, send up some smoke, next time bring a CB, or don't go out at all, not to the outback, not to the bush. In Australia, the bush has a very special meaning that's much bigger than the word. It's, it's absolutely a sum of all the things that Australians are afraid of, or that we're all afraid of, getting lost in the bush, because you probably won't get back. It's very confusing out there. Uh, I'm going way back to uh, gathering firewood here, a poem called Speaking. Have I made the mistake of trying to be too transparent to some human being? Is this why we turn to ducks that sail upon the river and manage to leave a pure V everywhere behind us, grieving waters? And this is a poem called Skid Row. And in relation to what I was saying about cutting and less being more, um, I don't know if it's true in relation to this poem, but this poem was once about three pages long. It's now four lines. <laughs> but I think it probably gets across the idea. Uh, Skid Row. Thin curtain bellowing out, endlessly begging in the night, and in the morning the last pennies out of a can for a plum. Uh, and this is WCW, 
knew a poet doesn't have to be on his best behavior all the time, has many bad poems, very lifelike, very relaxed, and breaks into song only on occasion, as all folks do, just walking along. And here's another poem about Williams. Um, I just think it's wonderful to be near those falls and uh, one of these days I'm going to get by Nine Ridge Road. Um, haven't paid homage yet. This is called Such a World to Fail. And this painter they called One Cornered Maw uh, was a master of that technique of doing something that's off in the very corner and then your mind does the imagining. Arthritic fingers, the chasm of mind. Williams, as one cornered maw of the Sung dynasty, who painted only mind, void, the soft nothing, though scholars and a dog might stand bemused cliffside. In this valley, we see regrets everywhere, the nest made of flung hair and the frail hell of hands. How our fingers shake our weak eyes failing the world. And, and this is a poem uh, I wrote in Greece. When I picked up a little marble fragment that was about half of a paw of a lion, and it was probably at least 2,000 years old, more like 3,000. If something is archaic, all edges have been dulled, broken by the sea, and yet some trace of the old life must be left, some evidence that this white stone was once a lion's leg or the base of an intricate temple. If that life surviving wind and sea does not lead us back in some effort to rediscover, retracking our own steps, then this something we have found in its desolation is not truly archaic. To be archaic is to exist in a state of transition between a silent life and a whispering death. Even our own bodies, when we stop and listen closely, seem to be giving off some aura of the genuinely archaic. And there's a little poem here called After Sappho, you know, when you steal something from another poet, you're supposed to say after. And um, it's just two lines. Let us live so that the rust of our bodies will rub off on others in future years. And um, Willis Barnstone, who's the translator of Sappho, uh, said to me one time, you know, I've been pondering that poem of yours uh, after Sappho. Uh, there isn't any uh, image like that in Sappho. It's yours. <laughs> well, I don't think Sappho thought much about rust. Uh, this is called The Shoelaces. Um, we were living in Spain. Uh, bending down to tie my son's shoelace where he sits in his stroller in a bar in Spain, I see below me a jumble of geologic layers and rivers of time. There are the crossbars holding the miniature and mystical cities. There is my own tweed sleeve, steel-toed shoes going back to freight-loading days. And there is this little man standing up, drunk with enthusiasm for a sick world. When I went to work at the LaSalle Street Station in Chicago as a freight loader with these steel-toed shoes, uh, one of the men said, uh, how do you like being a donkey? Because we had to pull these carts and stuff like that. This is the 4th of July. <coughs> Those. Uh, War monuments in Australia, by the way, are for World War I. And school children, even in the second and third grade, still write letters 
to the uh, fallen of World War I because Gallipoli means more to them than World War II. So they kind of skip all the other wars. But this one is World War II. The 4th of July, my uncle, Great Norman, whose leg was full of the finest German steel, broke three chairs and one table when the kids set off firecrackers on July 4th, 1946, just after apple pie. Uh, this is called a human donkey. And, and as I say, since you are writers, and we still, in a way, having a workshop, I'll mention how I wrote this poem, just you know, not to say it's anything of a poem, gong, but um, I was waiting to buy an airline ticket in Indian Airways office, airlines. And um, you have to wait in India two or three hours to get anything done. Uh, it's probably changed in the last 10 years because they have computers now. But at that time, uh, a clerk had to write out every airline seat on a little chart. So it took some time. So I thought, ah, rather than sit here and be bored, I'll write a poem. I didn't have a thought in my head. And so that's, I looked out the window and this is what I saw. The boy who tugs that cart along is 10 perhaps, a human donkey put out to work. His bare feet pad on the hot tar of India. Great sweat drops roll off his brow. He's got a load of rolled canvas, the kind we've seen staked to corral a crowd eager to see a film or used for walls of privacy at weddings. This canvas is strong as ship sail with bright swastikas appearing in every panel for good omen. It's heavy too, as that boy's effort shows. He leans forward as if into the wind and is nearly tipped off the ground when he takes that awkward turn that will take him away from me, past an angled concrete delta, under giant billboard lovers who can speak only in Hindi. They almost kiss, yet manage well to see out over the crowd of rickshaws. Smoke from the peanut stand obscures him now. He disappears in haze, a boy put out to labor, flagged with his blue bandana, tugging the flatbed cart that's set upon a truck's sheared off axle between two tread-worn tires at least 20 years older than this boy who's been put out to work in India.